I'm Chris. Food is one of those things in life that's both essential and enjoyable. Here at Regency TAFE, we pride ourselves on providing great food that makes people happy. Every day in this state, thousands of people handle food that's served to the public. That means a lot of happy customers every day of the year. But now and again, people like Joe get sick from something bad in the food that us food handlers have prepared. And that's something that should never happen. I thought I knew everything about how to handle food properly. But when I was asked to check out what can go wrong, I got a few surprises. The problem is the things that can cause people to get sick are invisible to us. Now, Microscopic organisms are everywhere. We have them all through our bodies. Uh, the soil's full of them. Most of them are perfectly harmless and many are good for us, helping us to digest our food, for example. But some are very bad and can cause nasty diseases such as tuberculosis, pneumonia and food poisoning, which I've had and I do not want to repeat. You should also remember that people can die from food poisoning. One of the trickiest things about this is that you often can't tell when you're eating something bad. Simply throwing out spoilt or mouldy food won't protect us. Now, when people get sick, it's often from food that looks, smells and tastes just fine. The type of bugs we don't want in our system can often be found on raw meats before it's cooked. Others can grow in food if it's left out too long. And another type of bug is spread by people who have a gastric upset. Better pop one of these on. You can't see the bugs. They're so incredibly small. But they exist all right. And they can cause big problems. Though they can't be seen, they can be beaten. It's not that hard, but it is a constant battle. Now, the front line in the defence against these bugs is you and me. Wherever you are, the principles of defence are the same. There are three main areas where these bugs might take advantage if we're not careful. They are cross-contamination, temperature control and personal hygiene. Let's start by looking at cross-contamination. When Joe's case was investigated, the food poisoning was traced to the coleslaw he'd bought four days before he became ill. Two hours before he bought it, the kitchen where the coleslaw was made was flat out. Merely rinsing the cutting board will prove to be Joe's downfall. No matter how well the food handler washes his hands or dries the board. And Joe was doomed. The bugs had already grasped their opportunity two hours earlier. All raw meat, especially raw poultry and offal cuts, has bugs on it. Many are harmless, but some are dangerous. The presence of a few really nasty ones is revealed with a bug cam. And until cooked, they remain a danger. Now we can see why simply rinsing and drying the cutting board wasn't good enough. And how the bugs grab their chance. 
With this type of bug, it doesn't take many to cause trouble. When you use that bug cam, it's easy to see what went wrong. You know, it's also easy to keep the bugs out in the first place by keeping them separate from your prepared foods. The simplest and best solution is to have a completely separate board for raw meats. Different colours help. And of course you should keep your knives separate too. However, if you have to use a board that's already been used for raw meat, or you're not sure what a board's been used for, then after washing it, you'll need to use either an antibacterial sanitizer or a dishwasher that reaches at least 65 degrees Celsius. And remember, our hands, whenever they come into contact with raw meat, must be washed thoroughly, as always. What we've been talking about is stopping contamination. Now, microscopic bugs cause the most serious contamination, but insects and dirt from animals can also get into food. So, the kitchen's not for them. Keep everything clean, and the risk of contamination goes right down. Wearing clean clothing also helps. It shows we have the right attitude. And if you have a cut or a sore, it should be covered to stop it getting infected and maybe contaminating the food. Wash fruit and vegetables if they're visibly dirty or if there's a chance they've got insects or slugs on them. We can also contaminate the food if we're sick, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. The main thing to remember is to keep the bugs separate from the food to be eaten. Those bugs are waiting for any slip ups in the food preparation chain. When you receive food, Make sure it's been properly packaged or covered during transport. In the fridge, raw meat should be stored so that it can't contact or drip onto other food and keep it separate when it's on display. Cooked meats must go on a clean tray or board, certainly never the same thing that held the raw meat, unless it's been cleaned and sanitised or been in the dishwasher. All food on display should be wrapped or covered in some way and unpackaged self-service food must be supervised. Again, there should be a barrier to minimise possible contamination between customers and the food. So, keeping the bugs separate from prepared food so they don't contaminate it is the first step towards controlling the bugs. The second area we have to look out for is temperature control. Within 15 minutes, Susan's friend was also taken ill. This case begins earlier that same day. Hey George, what do I do? Fridge is full. Oh, just cover it up and leave it on the bench. It has to be reheated anyway. That yellow stuff is bad news for humans. It's a toxin produced by the bacteria. So what went wrong? Bacteria can't survive above 75 degrees, so the boiling that morning would have taken care of them. Then it was covered during the day, so nothing could have got in. Of course, from the outside, it looks like nothing's going on. But the tricky little blight has left spores, which are like eggs, and they can survive boiling. They hatched into bacteria that found themselves living in a very nice piece of real estate in a very pleasant climate. With such nice conditions and lots of time, this sort of bacteria starts to multiply like mad. By dinner time, the rice was swarming with millions of bacteria and they all produced a toxin as they grew. While the bugs were killed during reheating, the toxin survived. And that's a poison for us if there's enough of it. And the moral of this story, uh, 
The little gliders can be very tricky. Yeah. But we also know how they operate, which means we can stop them. We know they like a nice moderate temperature with plenty of food and moisture to grow and enough time. Now, there will always be food we want to eat that bacteria like to grow in. We call this potentially hazardous food. And they include a whole swag of things, including milk, cream and custard, cooked food that has meat, rice, pasta, eggs or beans in it, prepared salads and homemade dressings like mayonnaise, and any food that contains these foods, such as sandwiches. In other words, a lot of the food we handle is potentially hazardous. It doesn't include acidic food, such as jams or yogurt, or dry foods such as biscuits or cakes, except if they have fresh cream or custard in them. What the bugs are looking for is a moist place with plenty of nutrients, especially protein. If in doubt, treat it as potentially hazardous, and you can always check with your local environmental health officer. The way to stop bacteria growing on this sort of food is to watch temperature and time. In other words, temperature control. The danger zone, where the bugs live, is between 5 and 60 degrees Celsius. Below 5 degrees, the bugs or microbes mostly stop growing. Above 60, and they're usually killed. That's fine as far as it goes. But what about when you can't keep it under temperature control? Like when it's on display? That's where time comes in. The sort of bacteria we're worried about here needs time to multiply. And it takes a while for the numbers to build up to where they become dangerous. How long? Well, four hours is the cutoff time. After four hours in the danger zone, chuck it out. There's a handy rule called the two hour, four hour rule. Say a meat and salad roll is prepared at 12 p.m. It can stay at room temperature until 4 p.m. Then it must be thrown out. If you want to keep the roll for later on, then you've got to put it in the fridge by 2 p.m. And when you take it out again, say at 6.30 p.m., it must be used within the next two hours, which is a total of four hours out of temperature control. Temperature control applies right along the food preparation chain. Once potentially hazardous food is thawed, it should be used as soon as possible, or stored in the fridge to keep it out of the danger zone. Someone should always be there when food is delivered, especially potentially hazardous food. It's best if this food is transported below five or above 60. However, if it is transported in the danger zone, then of course that time then counts as part of the four hours. Temperature and time. The bugs can use them if we get slack. Give them the right conditions and they'll take advantage every time. But as we've seen, we can also use temperature and time to beat the bugs. We know about the temperature danger zone and we have the two hour, four hour rule. Temperature control also applies to cooking and cooling the food. It sounds obvious, but food must be cooked thoroughly, especially rolled roasts, patties and sausages. Bacteria which naturally occurs on the surface can end up in the middle of these types of meats. So, no pink in the middle for these ones. Chicken must be cooked till the juices run clear and always stir food in a microwave to make sure it's heated evenly. If food has to be cooled after cooking, do it as quickly as possible. Aim to get it down to 21 degrees in two hours and then down to five degrees after a further four hours. You can put large amounts of cooked food in shallow containers to speed up the cooling. That's about it on the temperature control front. Now, the third and final area where the little blighters look for 